Hey everyone, first of all, welcome back, and second of all, welcome to Form Analysis with Dr. Beerson. Um, we're going to go over today some very basic concepts of form to give us an introduction to the course, and then from there we'll go into some more detail. Let's do it. Alright, to get started we're going to watch a clip of Somewhere Over the Rainbow from Wizard of Oz. And while we're listening, I want you to try and distinguish how many different sections you think that this song divides up into. So if you said two sections, you'd be correct. Um, the first one is somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. And then the other one is someday I'll wish upon a star. Da, 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 so how did I come to that assessment of the different sections in Somewhere Over the Rainbow? Well, today I'd like to demonstrate a little bit of that. Um, and take a kind of a top-down approach or a zoom-in approach um, to the units of musical form. So we're going to start with the largest and then get down into the progressively smaller. Sections are the largest units of form for today um, and they're labeled with capital letters A and B and so I've chosen uh, Hofstra colors gold and blue for those to color code it. And we define sections according to the contrast that they contain. So sections should contrast from each other. And the way that they do that um, are several, um, including but not limited to the following. You can have a change of key in a new section. You can have a new melody in a new section, uh, different rhythm, different orchestration, a different tone. So you might have um, maybe a pondering a section and then the B section might be more emphatic or you might have a hopeless A section and the B section might be more hopeful so you want to look for contrasts in all of these things taking a look at the score of somewhere over the rainbow I provided only the vocal line here because I wanted to fit it all on one slide but you can kind of get the idea the first line of music, the first eight measures, is the A section. Okay, the melody begins with the tonic note and the octave above it, and then gradually gets down little by little 
to the A flat note again. Now in measure 9 we have the same music, literally. So I'm going to call that A section again. Okay, so A, A. Now sometimes you can have slight variations when the A section returns. So perhaps the melody is changed a little bit, or maybe the lyrics are different, or maybe there's one chord different. But it's not enough difference that you think it's a new section. You still recognize it as the same section, the same music. If that happens, then we put a little prime sign next to the A. So that's why I put that in parentheses, because it's not the case in this particular example, but it could be in other ones, in which case you would put a little apostrophe next to the letter. All right, now let's get to this. Measure 17 is our B section. And we can see that it contrasts in a number of ways. The first contrast that pops out to me is the rhythm. So you can see that in the A section, we have um, slow rhythms starting out, okay? Those two half notes in the beginning of the A section. And then you go to quarter notes and then to the eighth notes, and then it kind of starts to move a little bit. In the B section, we go straight to the eighth notes for two measures, nothing but eighth notes. And then by measure 17, 18, 19, measure 19, the third measure of the B section, you get the slow half notes. Okay, so it's literally the opposite of the way that the A section was. And that, that is one way of achieving contrast, is by doing the opposite. The other thing is the intervallic structure of the melody. So the A section begins with these large intervallic leaps of an octave, and a major sixth, and a minor sixth. And this B section has really small intervals, like minor third, and then a major second. Okay, so the, the, the profile of the melody itself in terms of the intervals is completely the opposite. Okay, large intervals versus small intervals. And then another um, element that is uh, somewhat is contrasting is the harmony. If we look towards the end of the B section, so the third line, the third measure in from the end of that line, um, you can see that there's a D natural there. So D natural is not part of the A flat major scale. In fact, it implies an applied chord to five of five or seven diminished seven of five which is what it is in this case so we get um, a tonicization of the dominant and that gives us harmonic contrast because there's no key change or no there are no applied chords in the a section all right so you get the idea that the uh, the the sections are totally um, different from one another after the b section occurs we return to the a section and so this is a very common thing to do um, when you have a contrasting B section uh, especially if there's a key change then what usually happens is you'll return to the A section to sort of give a sense of returning home or um, coming back to a resolution after having gone somewhere different and the A section is kind of like the default of the song and it's what we want to hear come back after the drama of the B section everything changing um, that idea of drama and returning home is going to become important when we study sonata form later in the semester which is also kind of an AABA -A structure um, but I wanted to show you how this kind of operates in a more contemporary um, style of music alright so we've got our AABA -A -A large sections labeled all right, so now let's move down to the next level of form, which is phrases and ideas. So fitting inside of these larger sections are what we call phrases. And a phrase is a complete musical thought. It usually lasts for four to eight measures. And the thing that gives it its, com gives it its completeness is the fact that it ends with a cadence. Okay, and um, you know cadences um, either and you know cadences, um, I will do a little review slide of that next. But the, ha the phrase has to end with a cadence. Inside of a phrase consists a musical idea. A musical idea, I call it an incomplete musical thought, but it is in and of itself kind of this little um, separate unit. And in uh, music, usually these are two measures long. I, I famously call them two measure ideas in my ear training classes, and I, I harp on this all the time. But music kind of goes in these two measure ideas, and, and then from there it builds the phrase, and from there it builds the section. 
Okay, so cadences. Remember, we have the perfect authentic cadence, and this is what ends phrases. The perfect authentic cadence has to have a bass moving from a root position five chord to a root position one chord, and the soprano has to end on scale degree one. We call that perfect authentic cadence, or PAC. The next cadence is the imperfect authentic cadence, or IAC. Again, the bass moves root position five to root position one, but the soprano this time ends on scale degree three or scale degree five. That makes it imperfect authentic cadence, or IAC. And then there's the half cadence, or HC. That's when the bass ends on the five in root position. Okay, the, the phrase stops on the five. It doesn't resolve it to the one. We call that a half cadence, and that soprano can end on scale degree seven, scale degree two, or scale degree five. Okay, so let's take a look at the score again. We've got it already labeled nicely for our sections A, A, B, A. Now I wanna do a phrase and idea analysis. So the first thing I notice is that the opening A section is itself an entire phrase. And I label that with a slur. Okay, I just put a big slur over the entire phrase from the beginning to the end of it. I know that that's the phrase because that's where the PAC occurs. Now again, you don't have a bass um, notated here, but it does happen in the song. It goes five to one. And you can see that the soprano ends up from scale degree two, B flat, through a little decoration and then lands on scale degree one, A flat. So we do get a perfect authentic cadence right there. That's the first cadence that's happened so far in the piece. And so that's where I mark off my phrase. Inside of the phrases, you can have smaller musical ideas. And I always talk about the two measure idea, and that's indeed what we have in the first two bars. We have a two measure unit of music that's its own little melody, okay? And I mark those off with brackets over the top of those two measures. The next two measures are also a separate little idea, okay? So we have there another two measure idea. I'm not gonna mark off the next four measures because they take the same material from the previous two ideas and kind of continuously go on until the cadence occurs. Okay, so these four bars are what we call a continuation. The, 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 the material from the previous two ideas is now kind of flowing all the way to the end of the phrase. So I'm not gonna mark those off as ideas. All right, our A section which occurs again has the same exact structure. Okay, we got eight measures ending in a PAC, two measure idea in the beginning, and then another two measure idea, and then a four measure continuation to cadence. Now let's get to our B section. That also is a large phrase, and the conclusion of it is a half cadence. Um, what I said before about half cadences, they need to end on the five chord, which this one does. Um, and they need to have the soprano end on scale degree seven, scale degree two, or scale degree five. This one kind of does that. You've got your scale degree seven, G, right? Because we're in A flat major. So you've got G there, scale degree seven, T. And then you've got B flat, which is scale degree two, or Re. Now this is La, this is F, scale degree six. Now. This can happen when you get more to jazz and more contemporary pieces of music where you have what they call added dissonance to chords. This note actually fits over a five chord at the end of this particular phrase. So don't get thrown off by that. In more classical music that we'll study later in the semester, definitely this would not happen, but this is kind of a stylistic thing unique to jazz and um, uh, musicals. Okay. Now let's get into the ideas inside of this phrase. So I put this one at a four measure idea because I feel like it's a continuous um, piece of music that goes for four measures. You've got your eighth notes and then it leads directly to this, these two long notes at the end here. So I'm calling that an idea and you got a little space here of a rest to mark off that separation and then the same thing happens more or less I'll get into that in a second so I've marked that off as a four measure idea inside of the larger phrase 
All right, so that's our contrasting B section. And now our third A section is literally the same music as before. So it's got to have all the same formal structure. All right, great. This, by the way, is something that I'd expect you to do on a homework assignment, where you'll sort of mark off the phrases with the slurs, and then inside of the phrases, the, the separate musical units that I'm calling musical ideas that, that make up the phrase. You'll mark those off with brackets. Okay, let's go down one level deeper into musical form. That is the motive. Okay, a motive is the smallest um, unit of musical form and it is characteristic and impressive. So by impressive, I don't mean that it has to be big or loud or fancy. I just mean it has to leave an impression on somebody as a, as a musical thought, okay? So it has a characteristic to it, and um, when someone listens to it, they'll be they'll be moved somehow to listen to it. They say, "Oh, wow, that's that's interesting." It has some kind of interesting features. Um, they appear at the beginning of pieces or of sections as well. Um, those interesting features can be made up of things like intervals and rhythms, and they contain a memorable shape or contour. Okay, it's a little motive, sometimes known as sometimes referred to as motif. All right, let's go back to our score now. I got my A section and my B sections labeled. I got all my phrases marked out. I got my cadences marked. I've got my um, ideas bracketed. Okay, now let's take a look at that first phrase. I'm oh, sorry, let's take a look at the first section um, and the first measure of it. Okay, that opening octave right there, I'm calling that motive X. So when we do motivic analysis, we use the lowercase um, and the last, the last letters of the alphabet. So that, that avoids confusion with the large sections. You can see that I got A, A, B, A. Those are the first letters of the alphabet, and we use uppercase. Um, for the motives, we use lowercase, and we use the last letters of the alphabet. So I'm calling the opening octave on the two half notes, I'm calling that motive X. And to me, the distinguishing or the impressive feature of that is that it's two long notes and it's a large intervallic leap in the melody. Okay, next motive is the other part of that um, two measure idea. And I'm calling that motive Y. So that motive is quarter note, two eighth notes, and then two more quarter notes. And then it's got this sort of dip down and come back up. Okay, that's the contour of it. I'm calling that motive Y. Let's keep going. The next thing that happens in measure three is motive X prime. So I still feel like this is the same thing as motive X, but it's a little bit varied. And this happens a lot with motivic analysis that the motives themselves have to undergo a process of development and change throughout the piece in order to keep it interesting. And this is a really beautiful variation. Um, when you want to do variations when you're composing, it's always a great idea to keep one thing the same as you change one other thing. So you'll see here that the first thing that happens is the, the note is the same. It's the same A flat as the previous X motive. But this time, the rhythm changes. So we have, instead of a half note, we have a quarter rest on the downbeat, and then a quarter note. All right, so one thing changes, one thing stays the same. And then the kind of opposite happens in the next part of this X prime. So now the rhythm is the same as before, okay? It's a half note on the upbeat of the measure, but it's a different pitch. It's now F. So the rhythm stays the same in this one and the, the note changes. So this is a really elegant variation of that X motive. Now we'll keep going with that. The next thing that happens here is in measure five, another X motive. This time, it's the same thing as the previous X prime. Sorry, I'm calling this X prime. It's literally the same thing, except now the pitch is changed. Okay, so again, one thing stays the same, one thing changes. Both pitches have changed, but the rhythm and the overall contour are exactly the same as the previous X prime. Okay, this X prime leads us to Y, which I'm calling Y again. I think it's literally the same thing as before. Um, it's that sort of third down and then come back up through the eighth notes and two quarter notes. 
then there's no more x, but y happens again, and I'm calling this y prime. Why? Because the um, in the previous y, the start, the first quarter note was on the downbeat. This time, Harold Arlen, the composer, leaves a rest on that downbeat, and that forces everything else to the end of the measure, which has forces you to scrunch it up a little bit. So now, instead of two quarter notes at the end of the measure, we have two eighth notes. So it's it's um, varied. But I still think it's, and if you listen to the song, it's it's definitely the same motive. All right, so that's my motivic analysis of the A section. The next A section will have the same exact thing, so let's skip ahead to B. So that whole musical idea that I referred to before is four measures long, and so I've also made this Z motive four measures long. Okay, so you've got lots of things going on in here. You've got your um, you've got your eighth notes and the small intervals, and you got your two long notes at the end. In fact, the two long notes at the end are repeated. It's the same note, okay, both F. Now let's look at the next, the next part of this phrase. Now I got Z prime. Why did I call it Z prime? Well, it begins literally the same way as the previous Z, but this time, instead of um, in the second measure of it, measure 18 here, Instead of a major second, we've got a D natural, so we've got a chromatic note, and then we've got another minor third. And you can really feel the key change there too. So that's what's causing me to call this Z prime. It's a variation, but it's still it's still recognizably the same motive. Okay, the A section at the end of the piece will also have the same stuff as before, so that's gonna be the same motivic analysis. So all this put together, we've got A, A, B, A sections. All of them were eight bars. So four phrases of eight measures makes a 32 bar song form. And that's what this is. And a lot of pieces from um, the jazz, swing, or big band era will also be in 32 bar song form. As will, frankly, most pop songs from today. Even still, this is a very important form to know. So that's why I kind of wanted to start it off, start off our semester on that note. Um, the third phrase is the B section and it's the contrasting section. Okay, and then there's a return to the A phrase by the end. Our song Somewhere Over the Rainbow was a prototypical example of that. Um, it is in 32 bar song form. Now, I'm going to play the recording again at the end of this slide. So we'll listen to it now with more knowledgeable ears. Um, the song after the 32 bar song form is over continues on with an outro okay and the the music from the b section comes back to to do that but that's not part of the form itself that's tacked on to the end as an outro um, after the form concludes and in classical music language that's called coda but in jazz and popular music that's called an outro all right it's kind of an extra bit of music that's tacked on to the central form of the piece so Wow. 
All right, great. So to summarize our first lesson, we've got um, formal units going from large to small. The largest are the sections, which we label with capital letters A and B, and however more we need, C, D, E, F. These sections are defined by musical contrast of various types. Um, the next level down are the ideas and the phrases. And remember that phrases must end with a cadence, whereas ideas, that's not necessarily true. Ideas are two measure units inside of larger phrases. And inside of the ideas, we have motives or motifs. Okay, and those are again characteristic um, shapes, intervals, rhythms, something that catches your ear and gives a kind of identity to the melody you're listening to. And then all that stuff we used to analyze a piece in 32 bar song form. I will continue with Somewhere Over the Rainbow um, in lesson number two, um, and then we'll get into some other songs as well. And um, I'll talk about another concept that is important to this. But for now, let's pause it right there, and um, I'll see you in the next lesson.